quote, excuse me, that we are increasingly allergic to constraints and losing community in the process because few want to compromise their privacy and surrender their freedom. And that was mm-hmm. on page 87. So how are people then not wanting to give up their privacy and their freedom? Because that seems to be the price. In order mm-hmm. to have community, you have yeah. to give up something. Mm-hmm. Why are we so against giving that up to embrace this idea of community that we know is good and necessary Mm -hmm. for us to be the people? I mean, selfishly, for us to be the Mm -hmm. people that God wants us to be, Mm -hmm. as you said, Mm -hmm. we can't do this individually away from community. Mm -hmm. So how do we then help people to see that and enter into it? Yeah, you know, it's so hard. It's so hard because we still, even though so many of us love the church, they are committed to the church. They believe in the tenets of Christian faith and practice. Um, I mean, we've seen this and I'm sure you have too, where people just decide to leave, right. And they just kind of ghost you or, you know, members who have committed and made vows, then just leave, you know, and think an email saying, Hey, we're out. Um, is okay. And so, you know, as folks in pastoral ministry know that becomes kind of an aggregate pain and hurt where you're, you feel like everything's personal and it becomes frustrating when you go, when you think big picture, how is the church going to be a counterculture of love when we can't even stick with one another or even have the hard conversation about like whatever X, Y, Z issue was the precipitating issue. I mean, and that's just one example. We see it in, you know, lots of small ways where people don't want to volunteer or people just don't care, or they'd rather go to all of these fun vacations or have their kids involved in youth sports every single Sunday, whatever it is, where we don't actually functionally believe that the church is how Jesus says he's going to save the world, (laughs) right? We don't, we don't believe in, you know, Genesis 12, when, when God says to Abram that you're going to be a blessing so that you can bless the nations. Um, we kind of just see church as this nice little feel good experience that gives me another injection shot for another week of nice Jesus feelings. You know, the challenge then I think for us who is to put our money where our mouth is, um, to show up and to suffer with difficult people with, you know, people who, um, have a lot of pain, um, to suffer through awkward conversations, to, um, engage with people we might not naturally engage with, uh, because we know there's something in that person that I need and there's something that they need from me. And it can't, you know, I don't exist. John Dunn said, right. No man's an Island. So we can't actually flourish apart from other people. Although that is hard to communicate when they're not even there. Yes. When they're at home. Mm-hmm. just walled you. up in their little mini castle insulated yes. from the cares of the world it, it does call for a radical reorientation it does one of the things that we've called for is a missionary ecclesiology basically mm-hmm. the church needs to recover that idea of being sent on mission into the world yeah. and part of that mission yep. means vulnerability yes to the people around you and mm-hmm. i love how one person put it years ago i think it was in dillard i think was what she mm-hmm. wrote she said in in the church people are one of two things she said there are marbles or grapes. Marbles repel mm. one another mm. and send each other off in the um, other direction. But when grapes collide, they bleed mm. and they mingle oh, juices, good. quitting the sweet. I know. I love that image. That's good. No, Ann Ortland, not Ann Billard, Ann Ortland. Sorry. Okay. Um, but I love that imagery yeah. because that's it's the mingling together of that sweet fellowship that becomes the aroma of Christ that other people then are drawn to. Mm-hmm. Yet in our culture, we have allowed, and I think this is in many respects because of an anemic or shallow teaching mm-hmm. of what the kingdom mm-hmm. of God is that in mm-hmm. some respect has was allowed to flourish on the back of where America was 50 years ago and yeah. worked yeah. within a certain cultural context, but the topography mm-hmm. has shifted culturally yep. speaking. Yep. So now we have to go deeper into the, the roots of what the gospel is. And I see that in the younger generation too. Some of these younger people, I was at a conference recently and they're asking me questions of theologians that I that I know postgraduate students are just studying. So I'm sitting there going, they long for this. They don't want the McDonaldization of the church anymore. They don't want the show, the light show, the lights. They they don't care about that. They they could and some of them said, and again, these are 25-year-olds are like, get rid of all the lights. We don't care. 
just give me give me the depth of the word and what it means to have a relationship truly with God, not just individual salvation, but I need to know how it applies and seeps out into the other different spheres of my life. And I, I love, beautiful. I think God is doing a work there. Yeah. Um, Praise so, God. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Sorry. I'm just <laughs> Pass hope. the plate. All right. <laughs> We're going to have an altar call. We're going to run this thing. Yeah. Um, you quote a German philosopher, which you didn't name the philosopher, by the way. So I figured you were trying to get by it fast with there. It's Nietzsche, isn't it? Is no, it Nietzsche? no, it's Who a new it? guy, Hartmut Rosa. Yeah, oh, oh, I haven't read his big stuff. I've just read a short little book he wrote. He wrote. So you're trying to be idea. safe. You're like, okay, I don't want anybody to fry me. I don't know who this guy is. Right. Well, I know like his little book, but I haven't like read his core book. Okay. So. Okay. Well, so she said, <laughs> I, I was like, she's she didn't name him, so I do that when I don't want people to know who it is. Right. Then they'll yeah. Yell at me. No. <laughs> that's a good tactic though i'll remember <laughs> but you quote the german philosopher who writes of and because I, I didn't know his or her so now i know it's a his yeah yeah of his exasperation with the way the world works and says it's not because what is out there that is still being denied to denied to us but the frustration is is that we now have it under control mm -hmm. please translate for those <laughs> who are not phds from edinburgh <laughs> But Can I'm you not do the Scottish accent, PhD. by the way? Can you so, do it? Uh, I there was one children's book that we would read to our kids in a Scottish accent, so I still have that one. It was Harry McClary from Donaldson's Dairy, a, little, <laughs> oh, a wee little pup. Um, so yeah, I, I got that one still. <laughs> I like it. I <laughs> yeah, like my it. muscle I memory. Do, so I want to do Scottish all day long. If I could yes. preach like a Scotsman, I would. I'd yeah. do it. I love it. <laughs> anyway, Fantastic. keep going. Yes. So Hartmut Rosa writes about this idea of resonance. So, you know, whether it's um, kind of the magic of new falling snow, he uses that example um, in his book about that we somehow, it's almost like um, what Taylor would talk about, you know, as these sort of windows to transcendence um, mm. that in, in our modern world, you know, everything has become flattened um, that everything is within this imminent frame is how Charles Taylor would talk about it. And there's a sense for Rosa that, you know, there's, there are certain things that provide this sort of resonance that kind of widen our view, um, that actually a lot of our angst that we feel in modern life isn't because we're trying to like control everything. Um, but almost like we're dissatisfied with the fact that we feel like we can control everything. 